जय हिंद व्यूअर्स वेलकम बैक टू अनदर एपिसोड फ्रॉम एम आर ओ डाइजेस्ट फोरम्स टूडे वी हैव अ वेरी इलस्ट्रियस पैनल टू डिस्कस द वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट टॉपिक ऑफ ऑपरेशन रेडीनेस विद अ स्पेशल फोकस ऑन इक्विपमेंट रेडीनेस एंड इन आर पैनल विद आस वी हैव लेफ्टिनेंट जनरल डॉक्टर एन बी सिंह हु सर्व एज द डायरेक्टर जनरल ऑफ core of electronics and mechanical engineers director general information systems and was a, a founding member of the armed forces tribunal jabalpur he specializes in armored fighting vehicles and uh, has served in moscow as the military attache technical we also have with us uh, lieutenant general dr anil kapoor who served uh, as the director general electronics and mechanical engineers and director general information systems He writes and speaks on emerging technologies in many publications and platforms. And we also have with us Mr. Pradeep Gupta, who is a technocrat and an ex-bureaucrat. He is ex-OSD Indigenization MOD, ex-Joint Secretary MHA, ex-PS2 President, and ex-OSD and PS2 Defence Minister. So, to open the discussion, uh, may I request General Envy Singh? to to tell us uh, what is implied by strategic readiness and why does a nation need to invest in it then we sir in general terms we can say strategic readiness is basically the ability of any organization or a nation to create the depth or the scale to absorb the adverse impact of a catastrophic situation and to come out successfully uh, from it now this uh, catastrophe can be man made or it can be it can be natural so it can be fa famine pandemic earthquake floods internal strife external aggression etc so um, the measure of strategic readiness is basically taken as how effectively and how quickly a particular country uh, is able to address the situation and achieve normalcy now you take the case of uh, the quakes in morocco there has been enormous amount of destruction there and uh, it's only with the help of external agencies that they are trying to you know bring in normalcy there uh, we have seen how forest fires are spreading and creating uh, enormous amount of damage Uh, we saw that happening in a country like us also in the hawaiian islands and uh, uh, you saw the enormous, enormous amount of damages that took place uh, this is as far as you know in general terms <clears throat> uh, but coming to military it is basically again the military's ability to respond to a technological or a military surprise launched by an adversary to absorb the initial losses the destruction of infrastructure be it industrial infrastructure or logistic infrastructure and yet retain the ability to spring back and remain viable on the battlefield now two classical examples in military history of, of recent origin i can give uh if you look at the azerbaijan and armenian war Uh, the azerbaijanis kurdish turkish uh, turkish uh, military industrial complex were able to launch a an enormous amount of you know, technological surprise and we saw that in the destruction of huge amount of armor uh, of the armenians and uh, ultimately they were able to capture that whole area of uh, 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 which we, which internationally is recognized as belonging to the other uh, bajaj so yesterday also you must have heard it was in the news uh, that region and uh, before that in 73 in the yom kippur war everybody knows how initially the israelis were surprised suffered, suffered huge amount of losses but it was their you know their ability because remember that uh, the israelis at that time were totally dependent on imports and uh, like india in 1962 they had actually sent a huge list to the americans that we need these aircraft we need tanks and this that and all 
unfortunately it didn't arrive in time it came after the war uh, uh, finished so what did the israelis do it is courtesy that the technical competence of their of their crew and the maintainers that they got about you know uh, <clears throat> recycling the equipment which they had they had uh, which were damaged initially three four days of war they had 400 tank casualties another week and it was uh, about 800 but their crew and the maintainers sprung a strategic surprise on the egyptians and net result was you know that uh, the tables were turned now here again in the war in ukraine we have seen that uh, we, we've seen how the russian forces were initially surprised and uh, you've seen pictures of tanks being blown off or kind of combat vehicles being blown off and the uh, if you go by what is published on both sides of the line be it russian media or by be the western media the losses suffered by russia has been enormous you know a country losing about 1500 tanks 4000 pieces of artillery and large number of aircrafts and drones and all uh, actually one uh, was expecting that it will capitulate but uh, it organized itself it transformed into a war economy and today one will agree that you know they are in a better position to prolong this war as long as they want and prosecute it uh, till the end till the aims of their national security strategy whatever it be uh, is achieved so i think this in nutshell is what is strategic uh, readiness and it has several dimensions as i had uh, been always mentioning uh, People need to get to be, you know, they are really uh, a little confused about these terms which generally we see in uh, print, and uh, they need to be very, very clear exactly on what it means what is military effectiveness, what is operational readiness, what is structural readiness, what is mobilizational readiness, and the least understood of all this is sustainment readiness, which is the industrial surge or the maintenance surge which is needed to replace the daily losses on the battlefield, whether it is soldier or it is system. Because as you keep fighting, you know, this readiness uh, is not a permanent uh, thing that, OK, uh, you take a readiness review uh, today and then you assume that, OK, I'm ready now for uh, forever for combat. Readiness keeps falling down. It's a complex issue. It falls because the soldiers retire, so skill levels dissipate. It falls because your equipment ages with <clears throat> age, usage, and deployment. So re readiness has to be therefore examined through reviews regularly, whether it's a tactical level review or an operational level, level review or a strategic level readiness reviews. Now, these reviews must take place, and there is a method in doing these reviews, you know. Uh, uh, we all know it, but we know that uh, a lot needs to be done in it, uh, especially the depth to which we, 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 we need to go and identify as to how exactly are we or how much are we ready. Uh, so those things form a part of strategic uh, readiness. And as we move forward, we'll try and discuss these issues. Thank you, sir, for that. Um, now I'll uh, come to General Kapoor. Uh, so, Anil, uh, you have uh, so much of experience. You know, General NB has been also uh, alluded to the importance of MRO. And you have been uh, doing so much of work, writing so much in many publications, on, talking on many platforms. So from your experience, uh, what are the top five best practices in equipment readiness planning especially for the next gen MRO. General Kapoor, please. Uh, so let me start by saying that uh, when we look at a uh, framework of strategic readiness, uh, today there are two very clear, uh, if I may say, visionary profound statements which actually govern all this. Uh, the first is that capability takes time to develop. Intention can change anytime. And we have seen this happening in our uh, in, in the dark region where we have developed the capability now and we are well within our reach for intentions the second is 
whatever can be clearly defined can be precisely designed and developed and that is very important when we look at it from a strategic readiness perspective so um, with these two as the umbrella under which uh, we could look at strategic readiness uh, since you mentioned top 5 let me start by saying the first pillar is national strategy and security perspective so that is the first big umbrella uh, which we need to be very very clear what is our geopolitical and geo strategic challenges and compulsions and therefore what does readiness mean to meet these challenges what are our gaps what are the unmet areas of concern and how do we cover them that is possible through let's look at like we have got uh, so many of these BRICS, g20s g7s caucuses and others uh, which are actually coming together and quads basically to cover some unmet needs and meet some aspirations i think so that is one framework we need to define when we look at strategic readiness as to at the national strategy and security level what is a big picture and big brother handhold if i may say or handhold of equals or global south getting together to see how do we capture this for our meeting our national interests which are prime to us so that is the first pillar i would touch upon and therefore uh, it needs to have a very clear end state and sometimes it needs a review as the situation keeps changing so therefore it's something which is a document which will remain a work in progress but a basic framework has to be developed the second pillar i would say is enhancing technical thresholds and when i say enhancing technical thresholds i am alluding to two top pillars which i often say technology and data i think in times to come as much as it is relevant today and it was in the past technology and data will define a redefine shape of things to come and therefore we need to master we need to have a technology strategy we need to aim at technology sovereignty i've been talking about it quite a bit and unless we achieve that as one very important pillar i think Bharta, make in india self-reliance will be a pipe dream to make it happen i think we need a very very thoroughly worked out national technology strategy and work closely towards it the third is uh, we are a nation of uh, demographic dividend 700 million youth between 15 to 35 which is twice the population of us us is 350 million so i mean that is the kind of manpower that we have therefore looking at skill as the next caller i think we need we have enough human capital available which we should look at a human circulation they must go abroad they must go to us they must go to uk they must go wherever they want to go but circulate back the technology thresholds that we need so really speaking technology strategy is the third pillar the fourth pillar to my mind is uh, infrastructure and we need to upgrade our infrastructure regularly and when i look at infrastructure it is not only the industrial base and the defense industrial base it's looking at it right through till the edge because when you look at it from the perspective of uh, military and uh, armed forces i think there's a huge requirement of catering for the edge because at a point in time which we have even seen in the ukraine war it is the edge that counts you have never heard soldiers getting into looting for normal supplies it has happened in ukraine by russians which is something that needs to be thought through so therefore looking at the edge right through till the back end is a very important fourth pillar when you look at strategic readiness and it involves everything it involves the complete logistic supply chains it involves equipment readiness maintaining equipment equipment sustenance support and that gets me to the fourth pillar managing legacy i think as the technology and wheels of technology keep moving we will generate a lot of legacy and since we we'll generate a lot of legacy we need to also see how do we upgrade and infuse technology to keep it in step with the times and and one good example which i always would like to quote is condition monitoring systems i mean today a lot of wasteful maintenance practices come in by just in case maintenance because we don't know what to change and when to change we go in for periodic preventive maintenance which is a good way 
till you did not have technology but today technology available i think it is criminal waste of uh, uh, government money and of assets to not go in for such long term perspectives uh, based on technology and the last pillar i would like to say is that there are four key uh, principles on which we need to look at our future the first is automation the second is autonomy the third is precision and the fourth is positioning and why do i say so i mean uh, we've been reading about russian ukraine war i mean uh, 400000 uh, rounds have been fired 700000 artillery pieces uh, rounds have been fired but so much of tnt what is the net effect has anybody done what is the effect at the target end i mean not even 20% of the targets 80% 70 to 80% went waste and that's where the power of precision and positioning comes in so if we can build in systems maybe with just 200000 you could have had the effect of 700000 provided it was precise and nicely positioned in terms of time and space so therefore i think in times to come we need to look at these uh, essentials as part of our strategic readiness looking at it largely from military perspective but then i'm sure a equal fallout will be in dual use because all this will come in very handy when you look at nation development as well so these were some thoughts of that thank you thank you very much anil for that so mr pradeep gupta you have seen uh, general kapoor mentioning about uh, technology and how you know it can be leveraged maybe you could build on that with your experience you have been talking about it writing about it uh, how do you think uh, we can leverage uh, new age technology in enhancing equipment decisions mr gupta please thank you general mataru uh, uh, wonderful narration by uh, general uh, nb singh and general kapoor uh, uh, both of them a very great perspective they have given and uh, general kapoor uh, just now spoke about the technology and data uh, we have to develop tech strategy and uh, uh, how we have to manage the legacy when to upgrade or retrofit the equipment uh, uh, to modernize it so uh, building on this uh, uh, i would like to uh, suggest that uh, how we will be uh, uh, leveraging the uh, ai uh, new age technologies that is the ar vr etc Uh, uh by the way i am not an operation expert i am not a uniformed officer but then uh, my close interaction over two three decades have been with the armed forces and uh, uh, at various levels so based on that experiences and my experience in defense procurement also i'll share my thoughts that uh, one is of course uh, jal kapoor has just mentioned about the predictive maintenance uh, 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 wherein uh, how we will be using this uh, uh, ai machine learning to predict the military equipment Uh, uh readiness and well it is likely to fail and to take up uh, uh there are uh, if we have to tell about the nitty gritties it will take one full session but i'll just touch, uh, touch on the major points on this uh, particular thing the uh, we have to basically install sensors and collect data from the equipment i think all the equipment which are being inducted for last decade or maybe uh, one and a half decades and more in the future times to come will are having uh, sensors and a uh, uh, lot of data is generated so we have to make utilize that data and uh, uh, just predict the maintenance like for the aircraft or for the ship or any equipment then uh, uh, this will certainly reduce the, uh, the downtime and uh, availability will increase the, uh, the training and simulation is a very important aspect uh, that we have to utilize the vr ar techniques to Uh, uh, empower the uh, the soldiers or the uh, maintenance personnel at the border as well as connect them at the uh, base stations or uh, at the headquarters or wherever the uh, uh, things are there with the availability of technology of 5g uh, the uh, worker at the or the soldier at the uh, uh, position where the equipment is being operated he can uh, pan that equipment that area and seek guidance from the uh, person sitting in the base this is one Uh, uh that is part of the uh, remote assistance also what we'll be doing uh, of course inventory management is one area where we can uh, uh, utilize the uh, uh, ai uh, uh, this ml as well as ar vr to have a sub- complete supply chain management 
and the uh, stocking of the spare part, which level, what kind type of spare parts we have to uh, use. So there is no uh, overstocking or understocking. And we have some kind of uh, just in time of uh, thing. Uh, certainly, uh, AI will give us a lot of uh, uh, support in uh, arriving at a decision based on our past uh, uh, experiences and some data we feel that this kind of operation we are going to prepare for. Then, uh, of course, uh, data analytics, because uh, 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 we have a uh, 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 lot of information being generated about the, info, uh, the operation planning. So in that, the what is the uh, information relevant to the equipment readiness? Uh, that can give us a very uh, different perspective and uh, we can utilize that data for the enhancement of the mission planning. So there is no uh, uh, failure of the critical equipment at the event the mission is undertaking. Then, of course, the uh, uh, autonomous systems uh, are there being utilized by the armed forces nowadays, that is drone uh, uh, surveillance reconnaissance equipment. So in that, uh, uh, how the AI and machine learning uh, will be uh, uh, utilized to operate the system independently, of course, uh, like for the drone, for the logistics, uh, uh, where we can, uh, how much equipment we can, or how much parts we can uh, fly through the uh, drones. So that is where uh, one part we can use these new age technologies. Of course, when we are uh, in the uh, open domain, cyber security will be an uh, issue. We have to uh, uh, hedge ourselves and uh, protect uh, the entire communication system for them. Uh, then uh, uh, the energy is one part where there's the nowadays uh, uh, there is a lot of stress on the uh, energy efficiency and uh, controlling uh, I mean, for the climate perspective. Uh, mm. That is where we can uh, utilize these uh, new technologies for the uh, AI-based uh, uh, energy ah. management systems. Uh, Dabu. Is, uh, Dabu. Uh, of course, uh, uh, one another area what uh, I am just suggesting is the collaborative uh, 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 approach uh, we can have, wherein the armed forces officers, of course, are the best, but then and they are the people at the uh, uh, hotspot. But then uh, they must have some system wherein the non-armed uh, forces, that is the civilian domain or the academia or the research uh, uh, people are also connected with them. So there is continuous institutional exchanges of uh, uh, ideas and knowledge is happening. So we can continuously build up uh, uh, on this particular uh, aspect of uh, this. And uh, since the data we are using uh, uh, recently, about a month or two months back, the data production bill has been passed. So now uh, uh, one uh, compliance uh, task or uh, responsibility has come on us. So we have to be very careful in uh, uh, observing and how the data is being utilized and uh, what we are doing. So uh, this is what uh, in broad, I would like to uh, mention that uh, new age technologies, how we can leverage to enhance uh, uh, these things. Everywhere in all these things, we have to have uh, AI algorithm, machine learning experiences, uh, augmented reality applications, which is also based on data uh, and uh, other analysis. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Pradeep Gupta, for that uh, very uh, broad canvas which I covered, giving such uh, so many important points. So uh, if you look at the way MRO activities are getting more complex and their importance to strategic readiness, as already General NB has also mentioned, and there are certain gray areas uh, which emerge, uh, especially in the understanding uh, by non-MRO personnel and within MRO personnel of uh, different uh, specializations, different sectors. And uh, there's a lack of comprehension on what needs to be done. And uh, also uh, recently, as we have seen uh, in the case of the war in Europe, uh, and General NB has been using a term, uh, also he has uh, called resilience. This is coming about. So, uh, Jal Envisa, what do you uh, think about how do we close this uh, gap between MRO people, non-MRO people, within MRO people, within sectors, and how do uh, what do you feel, what do you uh, think about this resilience which is now coming up, Jal Envisa? Uh, see, this <clears throat> resilience is a term which has again <clears throat> you will find it has come up only after uh, <clears throat> this war which has been prolonged for now close to two years it's only after that that uh, this term has started coming in and basically it reflects a nation's uh, ability to pursue its national uh, defense strategy 
for extended durations. Because earlier, you know, the whole concept and planning was that wars will be short and swift, and therefore uh, one need not plan for the long haul. But uh, this war has indicated that, you know, depending upon the uh, capability of the two warring sides, the stronger uh, adversary is in a position to call the shots and extend the duration of the war till the other side either capitulates or finds it absolutely economically and militarily impossible to continue the war. Now, you are seeing that chinks in the armor, they're already with uh, Poland now <clears throat> uh, banning import of Ukrainian grains and also not agreeing to go uh, give them any more weapon platforms other than those promised. Uh, other nations also, you know, having given them a certain amount of uh, uh, hardware and there after we don't hear much of it. So you will find that uh, one of the sides will be in a really precarious situation in case the support from the West uh, doesn't continue to flow in. Uh, so resilience has basically been used in that context that the nation itself must have the industrial capability and the resources to be able to uh, sustain the adverse impacts of war. And in our context, it becomes very, very important because numerically, our prime adversary is, is having many times more uh, platforms, aircraft, uh, <clears throat> marine vessels, uh, and other, you know, in, in, in fields of other fields of technology like the like surveillance, space-based systems, the uh, uh, data-driven combat, which which uh, Anil has just talked about, electronic warfare, drones, and all it has. He has a huge advantage over us. Uh, it's a fact which we have to accept. Uh, and the good thing is that most of its systems are being made indigenously there itself. They don't have to rely for a uh, uh, for the gyro block from some other count country. And if the gyro block doesn't come, what happens? You all know. So, uh, so you know, therefore, in our context, uh, re resilience becomes very important that, yes, we need to create that capability. And how do we create that? I feel the most important thing is tech savviness. We talked about the demographic dividend. But if we don't teach these demographic dividends, the basic thing of, uh, of standing in a line or to how to queue up, then this dividend is of no use. I mean, so first of all, it is important that tech savviness comes in into, the, into this youth which we are talking about. There are a number of them who are tech savvy you know, from some parts of the country, but then that must be reflected everywhere in our, you know, day-to-day uh, -day working everywhere. And more so in the military. Whenever some radical changes take place, you know, you find a whole lot of veterans and the people in uniform up in arms, like the Agniveer scheme. I think Agniveer scheme should be used to raise the technical threshold of the Indian Army. Today, it is very important that the soldier who is manning this complex weapon system, I'll, I'll talk of the standard rifle which we have got. <clears throat> you see, as long as the rifle was being used minus the sights and all that, it's okay. Today it is, comes with four sights. And it is a rare phenomena to see a chap, a, 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 a rifleman, to be hands on on the rifle itself and the sights. For the sites, he will he'll, he'll need the help of a MRO professional. So that is where I feel that, you know, first of all, uh, we MRO professionals have a responsibility uh, towards the army, seeing the actual state of affairs. Things will not change overnight. So first of all, we need to increase our, enhance our tech savviness. Then using that, we should be able to then gradually, you know, uh, the, the initiatives which were started off by us, you know, uh, technology transition and all that, that need to be now reinforced so that we make the crew of a platform, make the crew of a weapon system more tech savvy 
and the more tech savvy he is the lesser will be your problems he'll be able to look after his weapon properly he'll be able to ex extricate maximum equipment capability from his weapon platform and if he is able to do that then you are in any case you are you are inching towards you know ideal strategic readiness so nah. the effect of this you can see on both sides you see the ukrainians how effectively they have been able to handle the diversity of platform it's not an easy job to have weapon systems coming from england from germany from poland and from uk and from us and then trying to you know uh, be hands on it and try and and be ready to use it in war it's not an easy thing we know it we 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 we, are, we we also have a kind of a medley of systems and how difficult it is to to firstly train the crew who has been used on used to russian systems to on on western systems and then how to maintain it but it is their technical competence that they have been able to address this diversity of platforms second is the data driven combat, uh, combat you know they get their info, uh, their, their uh, intelligence inputs from starlink then they are using novel mobile network channels to send that image to the place where it is required and then they are carrying out precision kills so there is no they, they don't have a network army where everything is they they are using what is available and they have been able to you know put encryption layers on it on their own using the with the help of the civilian workforce and they are using it then you must have heard, heard about the drone workshops how effectively you know huge amount of drone workshops have come up in ukraine you know and they are using cots technology to uh, to 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 rig them up and use them on the other side you see the russians how today nobody says that you know the turkish drones have done this and turkish drone no because they have been able to effectively uh, neutralize their capability they have been able to effectively eff effectively neutralize all these gps guided rounds so uh, both sides you can see that because of the tech savviness of both the sides whether it is the soldier or it is the civilian workforce they are able to uh, uh, you know retain the balance i mean uh, and this is what is military effectiveness military effectiveness is the ability of a force to perform better than the adversary that is that that if you can do that then there is no way the adversary will be able to you know simply run through you uh, the, the the way the russian army had planned so i feel the first thing is this then second issue is you know you we, we need to actually go into this situation we keep talking about cbm and ai based cbm and things like that uh, we have to understand as to why uh, why the us army having been mandated to 20 years back has still not gone in for cbm why is it that you know some experimentation has only been done in the air force in the navy and yet nobody has you know uh, passed a kind of a legislation or a or a order that okay every system will now be uh, condition monitored yes the navy is doing it in their uh, latest uh, you know uh, marine vessels because of uh, i will say again because of tech savviness and a better understanding but you look at others they have not been able to do it and not only as you look at the british army also Uh, despite the fact that their platforms are all you know run by controllers and it's very easy for them to get the data so i feel that uh, the one of the major uh, limitation has been that uh, we have not been able to go beyond measuring once you get the data what do you do out of it so this is one area which is basically a software portion is that once you get the data then use that data to improve to optimize your work so using that data i feel that we should be able to use ai to 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 ramp up platform readiness and how do we do that we use that data firstly to find out okay what is the 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 requirement of readiness base pairs 
where should they be located how should they be moved forward you know because you see this fighting wars and you, exploitation of platform is a high risk job and in a high risk job like firing you know uh, uh, you know sending a spacecraft up or sending a uh, or an aircraft it is very rare that you know people will agree to hand over everything to ai they will always want a human intervention so very wherever there is high risk application ai will only at best be used as an assistant and uh, uh, we see the example of this in this war where ai is being used by the ukrainians um, to first of all identify high value targets to decide when a barrel is to be replaced uh and and things like that so i think uh, till the time we are not able to use the data generated by predictive maintenance for prediction of the operational readiness rate you will find very few takers the day we are in a position using data to decide that okay whether for this particular operation regiment a should be used or regiment b should be used or formation a should be tasked or formation b should be tasked or platform a should be tasked or platform b should be tasked that's the day when you will find that people will off say yes now we should go in for cbm we will otherwise it will always get you know in the face of competing requirements uh, you will always find uh, that uh, it will occupy a back seat, uh, back seat and it may not get that required amount of funds to uh, to go ahead whole hog yes you may do experiments here with a squadron here or a, or a regiment there but uh, not beyond that so i feel that more than online measurements it is the data processing which is which is important and if we can do that and predict outcomes then possibly we we may be in a position to you know expand the scope of cbm so uh, this is what i feel uh, you know these are some of the issues which need consideration and um, as far as building up resilience is concerned i think everybody has talked about it first of all is yes you need to have your soldier ready for combat uh, which means that highly trained uh, manpower i'm talking of the military uh, sphere highly trained soldiers highly trained technical manpower your uh, ready, ready to fight equipment uh, good logistic planning so that uh, the required support is available at the desired uh, place uh, at the national level you need to you know uh, develop your comprehensive national power so that you are in a position to use resources divert resources today i mean i recently uh, came back from armenia and i found huge amount of russian tourists moving around in that country so uh, what it indicates is that the human the, the amount of resilience which that country has because you know there is no kind of a general uh, mobilization there or things like that i mean people are still moving around doing business as ever despite all these uh, huge amount of you know sanctions and constraints there and uh, yet they are also managing the front line a huge front line which is i think runs over 3000 kilometers or so so uh, that will only come if we build ourselves industrially and uh, all this uh, planning of atmanirbhar bharat digital india things like that all that you know comes to fruition at an early date and uh, it's very important it's very important for us to rely on home grown systems home grown weapon platforms which which are simple to operate simple to maintain and we are in a position to field them in large numbers because future wars if at all it takes place will witness enormous amount of combat enormous amount of attrition the guy there is capable of you know raining down 10000 rounds a minute on any target which he chooses now what will be the condition of that target uh is <laughs> something which uh 
we need to examine i mean so so there will be huge amount of attrition there will be complete uh, you know you know the back end infrastructure be it it be it power be it power generation be it um, your uh, logistic installations all that will suffer are likely to suffer uh, huge amount of attrition and therefore you have to be prepared for it which can't happen if you depend on somebody else for your uh, platforms and also for the in supply chain thank you sir thank you very much uh, for touching on those uh, variety of issues which uh, contribute to resilience uh, general kapoor uh, this issue of uh, cvm and how can organizations get cvm ready what are the challenges and uh, since you have been you know covering this and talking about it uh, and uh, much more than that on the use of tech in uh, this how do you feel that we can become more um, uh, we can adopt this become uh, organizations can start adopting it uh, what we need what need to be done general kapoor please that's a that's a great question sir in fact uh, the whole crux lies in uh, i always say knowing what to do quite a few know but getting things done is very few who can do it and i think today while resilience is one word which has come out from the war i think in india we are a resurgent india today we are resurging i mean we saw it some time back we were the golden bird or whatever we had a dip but i think we are resurging now and um, with every event that happens whether at the national or global level it only we only come out stronger and the g20 was a great example where we came out stronger and uh, the whole world saw the the power of a resurgent resurgent india how it is coming up and today when we move around and we've seen it uh, in our lifetime only you know a, a two lane to a eight lane highway i mean two lane national highway to a eight lane national highway and that is one good example of how much it can add to your gnp uh, gdp and uh, your gross national product as well so um, now coming to the cbm in particular uh, i feel that digital india is perhaps um, a iconic program never ever heard globally including america whom we hold in very high regard most of the times i think they have a lot to learn in technology from india the upi today is a great example where even a, a hawker on the street it tells you to pay him through paytm i mean that is the edge that is how we have handled edge we have handled the complete software in any case we are masters of software globally i think even in the us every software gets developed where i am saying noida most of it happens here and i have come across a large number of companies which actually are looking at doing a lot of software work and of course we got them all over pune bangalore you name it every place today even gurgaon as a hyderabad i mean it's india today is a new india for sure and people are eating out of our hands there is no doubt every growing nation is eating out of our hands and therefore i think it's a easy fix software is a easy fix today even hardware for us is a easy fix having demonstrated to the world the power of upi i think cbm is the next disruption waiting to happen and and i'm quite convinced that it is fairly easy now for us to do it and why do i say so uh, today the indian navy and the marine industry and i'm aware of it is actually totally cpm compliant when a ship is about to go on sail it's just the captain just sees the dashboard and it's all greens and if ever anything is coming close to an amber it is put into a immediate refit depending on the time of voyage or the operational pulse as we call it so really speaking navy is mastering this art now the indian armed forces and uh, i'll talk out of my own experience i have seen this and i have demonstrated it um, along with some very good uh, startups who actually demonstrated uh, i alluded in one of the seminars on using a torsion vibration sensor as to the complete doubt and gray zone that we have even in terms of a vehicle engine life was actually um, demystified when we get went into cbm first we have to make up our minds that we need to move out of legacy and that's a big change management we are just in case people we are not just in time people and especially at the senior level and we've all been fairly senior generals the knowledge and absorption of technology and adapting a change 
is very, very difficult. And that's why today startups are youngsters because the elder guys get very foggy. And if you're not foggy, you can be a great startup at the senior level, actually. And therefore, I would say that today, given the technology thresholds which are available in the country, industry, startups, uh, public, private sector, both the ecosystem, and also I must tell you, it is happening. Today, even in DRDO, we have a CBM society, which has been configured, which is looking at it exclusively for all the legacy companies. And I happen to be uh, being with them and advising them on how to go about these things, especially when it comes to mechanical and electronic systems. And the reason is that that is which will actually get you the bang for the buck. Otherwise, you'll be carrying so much of wasteful inventory, which you may feel is actually weighty. It'll be weighty in weight, but may not be weighty in use. And you may end up before any operation, let's change the engines just because they are available. It's like everything looks like a nail when you have a hammer in your hand. I think we need to get out of that syndrome. And uh, the moment we did it today, uh, at the technology level, we have the sensor uh, stack available, technology stack of sensors available. At the hardware level, we have the, uh, you know, even a mobile phone is a good hardware to give you everything that you want. At the software level, we have people who can do the software. And at the design level, we have got the uh, uh, UX and UI, user interface and user experience, which can be done through dashboards. And even it will be so simple that even a uh, operator could say, well, it is green, I don't need to bother. And he knows in how many hours it will turn amber. It's exactly like when we are moving on a car with a speedometer in front of, uh, sorry, with a uh, fuel gauge in front of us, we exactly know that it is going to hit emergency now. It's only five liter left. But till then you're quite settled. We have not touched the emergency. Let me keep moving on this highway. So it is going to be like that. And that sets up, uh, that is one uh, thing which I would like to talk about CBM. That, that, that is an idea, the time of which we are already late for it because the technology is already there. And even in the US, I must share my experience of US. I, was, I hired a number of cars when I traveled this time in US. I went to Canada and everywhere. And I often quote this example. Uh, I did it with a company called Enterprise. I took their car. And somewhere down the line, they gave me a ring that uh, at the next uh, exit 10, please turn right and uh, go to the Enterprise showroom. There'll be somebody waiting for you there. When I went there, they said, your rear tire is uh, there's a leak in your rear tire. We can sense some vibration. And when, they, sure enough, when they opened up, they found that there was nozzle. There was a very, very feeble leak in the nozzle. And they changed the tire for me. So imagine somewhere I'm driving. I didn't get that feel for sure. And I was driving at about 80, 90 miles per hour. It can be catastrophic if it did burst. But here's somebody monitoring from behind. And if they can monitor pan US a vehicle by an enterprise, you could imagine what would be happening in defense for sure. They are there. Okay, we don't know it because quite a bit, bit of there is shrouded in secrecy. We'll get to know after 10 years. It's like they give you a GE engine, which is 1990 technology in 2023 with a transfer of technology, 80% as if it's hell of a uh, technology being transferred. Sorry, we have to get out of that thought. We have to now get on the other side of the fence because we are technically competent and brilliant. It's just that we have to get our act together and I think do it. Um, so, so that is one aspect, sir. I'd like to touch one more aspect, and that is the future warfare landscape. And here I'd like to bring in a term which I also use as responsible strategic behavior. I think today India shows a very, very responsible strategic behavior. G20 was a great example. Wherever we posture ourselves, you see it is out of huge deep thought. It is never casual and it is impactful. And I think that is the power of our, if I may say, uh, strategy today. And therefore, when we look at strategic readiness through a future war perspective, let's look at a future war which will be actually run by unmanned systems. I mean, we know Armenia, Azerbaijan, or Azerbaijan use unmanned systems to actually knock off a lot of manned systems. So even in our case, we should look at unmanned system, whether it is robo humanoids, whether it is unmanned ground vehicles, unmanned aerial vehicles, unmanned ships, unmanned seabed vehicles. I think in every space we can do it. If we can launch, uh, if, we, if we can reach the moon and take a robo there and control the robo on the moon. I mean, what is it on the edge? I mean, today we have the wherewithal. 
we are the we are we are a great nation today only thing is i think we need to get our strategy right our strategic thought right and from space to earth and underwater i think we can be the masters we can tell the world or we can sell the world uh, the technology of yesterday tomorrow because we have it that's my thought sir. that's my thought i feel that we have it there and i think we need to only put the right people at the right place to get the right impact if that happens i think we will do it right that's it sir. that's for me thank you anil thank you for that uh, mr pradeep gupta uh, this uh, aspect of resilience which uh, general nv has uh, talked about and uh, so <clears throat> may i have your views on the resilience and uh, maybe look if you can look at the industry because you have got so much of experience there as to how uh, you know in uh, strategic readiness the aspect of resilience comes in and how as general nb has already highlighted it so what are your views on this resilience and strategic readiness mr gupta please uh, thank you general mataru uh, uh, general nb uh, spoke about the resilience uh, it is very important uh, uh, aspect uh, uh, that the sustenance of the uh, Uh, the supply uh, the uh, metal of the people there because if the war prolongs uh, how we will really sustain so this is where a uh, uh, lot of things uh, uh, are required uh, the uh, first of all our own uh, uh, the military industrial complex because whatever is with the armed forces is there with them but then uh, in case of long drawn uh, uh, engagements how will uh, we uh, fill the gap and attrition what is uh, he mentioned about so that's what uh, we are trying to build through our atmanirbhar campaign that is one part of it and uh, wherever there are gaps we are trying to fulfill it through the import and uh, acquisition from abroad now uh, in this uh, uh, very important aspect also what we see is the, uh, that uh, we must be uh, uh, also developing skills to uh, at least uh, cater to the new requirements uh, happening because uh, whatever new technologies are coming are quite disruptive and uh, uh, where people have to learn uh, uh, or unlearn the old uh, skills and uh, relearn the new one or learn the new ones somewhere uh, we have to reskill somewhere we have to upskill so this is one part of it and uh, resilience is also not alone it will happen by uh, say the armed forces or the industry whole ecosystem has to be created Uh, that is very important where the uh, government uh, uh, mm -hmm. fund support as well as the private corporate and all other uh, should be there to support for the equipment uh, part of it is wherever the uh, individual uh, officers are concerned certainly they are uh, uh, there to fulfill their need so resilience is a very important thing and we must uh, uh, somehow uh, plan the uh, things accordingly keeping in mind because what the ukraine war has shown us it is still going and we do not know how long it will uh, go because it has its own side effects happening in that region other small small wars are also taking place so uh, uh, what he mentioned that they have used uh, on 700 ton 1000 tons of uh, uh, explosive uh, in this war uh, are we prepared for this so we have to look at it that uh, uh, how we will be bracing our uh, because we have two major adversaries on right and left western border and northern borders so be prepared for uh, uh, engagement with both of them simultaneously so in that case uh, the worst uh, scenario we uh, uh, keep in mind and then start uh, uh, thing the supply chain not only inside the country but in outside the country also you must uh, keep the things uh, in mind that how will be uh, getting to that so this is just a small uh, 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 my peek into the resilience thing what how we can mind interpretation uh, think uh, what i had this yeah thank you very much mr gudeep gupta general nb sir may i request you to give the closing uh, remarks for today's panel general nb sir yeah yeah certainly <clears throat> no i'll be very specific with respect to the indian military only because uh, you know finally it comes down to uh, in, in actual military operations or actual combat it is the military which has to be strategically ready of course the entire country will be there in support but uh, the whole thing essentially starts from the military and then pans outwards so in this field i feel the first fundamental thing is that we should get into this practice of carrying out a fleet readiness review which is very important because it will tell us how far 
a regiment or a formation can run how long can it jump it is very important today we don't have any metrics of knowing it you know now whatever it takes we should sincerely do this because at the end of this readiness review whether it is done quarterly or annually you will come up <clears throat> will identify capability gaps so the second step is that the acquisition should be based on capability gas gap analysis and not first pass the post uh, principle you know that any scheme which gets through usko kharid lo without realizing ki what actually are the capability gaps so that is very important and i feel this is where uh, humans have a, at least the the our uh, you know acquisition directorate has shown its inability uh, to base acquisitions on capability gaps so this is where i feel ai it is time for ai to step in and at least tell them that look friend based on your fleet readiness review these are the schemes on which you should focus third is you know uh, self reliance and platforms and here i will be a little bit more restrained you know while we may have great capabilities of designing a ui and a great capabilities on 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 software maintenance and things like that but remember remember that when it comes to computing and you know very high end computing everything is all from outside right including the operating system so we while we may be you know good at assembling all this the fact remains that you know the motherboard this has been made by somebody else and uh, 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 the, the firmware is somebody else's so you know you you there's something called systems integrity till the time you are not in a position to make your own software firmware and also at least the critical components of the hardware if you if you if you're not then uh, you don't have that capability of scaling up of, of the resilience will not be there yes as long as that source is willing to give you you will be in a position to you know roll out platform so you know it is important that self reliance is done in in very genuine terms and this cannot come on its own we don't have the intellectual capability to be able to you know design a aircraft uh, a jet engine for uh, the fifth generation aircraft we'll have to take some help from others and we got to pay for it this is what israel did this is what china did so we are no exception then the most important thing apart from this is self sufficiency in ammunition because today even for explosives and propellants you are dependent on you know countries uh, uh, very small countries who possibly have developed the core competence of making propellants of the right rate so that is another area where you need to work apart from that yes i feel that this whole human resource of ours which is sitting in these cities like bangalore and uh, and, and pune and gurgaon and all that has to be trained right from school to innovate ahead of the rest of the world this is not happening today i mean you end up the, the startups which we are seeing are all essentially you know aggregators so and wherever there is some something happening it is courtesy joint ventures somebody is there behind to so it is very important that we start this whole thing of making our youth innovate ahead of the rest of the world and when it starts that it is then only that after a 10 15 year time gap we'll be able to then you know market our systems all over the world before that i think we need to be little calibrated don't have to create a bally who that yes this is possible that is possible at the grassroots level we are seeing we are seeing in you know basic programs like the dg core indigenization the bmb repowering uh the the light tank uh the your guns your uh, 155 mm gun system we see the amount of import content in that is is uh, very large and uh, these are the capability gaps which will trouble us later on 5 10 years after fielding so a comprehensive planning has to be done on this and uh, uh, as a lesson from this war i think it is important to focus on data driven combat 
on the shooter you know, sensor link. Control of the electromagnetic spe spectrum. This is what the Russians have shown. You know, EW has occupied a back seat, at least in the army. It needs to come to the front line. And EW is what will, you know, will carry the day for you in future combat. Apart from that, of course, space-based systems and drones and, and anti-drone systems and UGVs and all that, we can we can talk about all these things. These are all, they, they will not cause any disruption. They will only, you know, help you as far as military effectiveness, operational effectiveness is concerned. But the basic thing is to see that your whatever equipment you have, keep them ready for combat, whatever soldiers you have, train them well and keep them ready for combat. If you can do the both these things, I think you know, with the kind of uh, standing army we have, the kind of, uh, you know, the second line of defense, the paramilitary forces and things like that, you have enough, you can create enormous resilience too for long drawn uh, wars in which maybe you will be in a position by better planning and coordination to wear down the other side instead of you losing resilience. It is the other guy who will lose resilience and finally uh, capitulate. So that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, sir. In fact, General Envia, thank you for the closing uh, remarks there. And, and thank you, General Kapoor, for being part of the panel and giving such uh, deep insights into technology and the future. And uh, to Mr. Pradeep Gupta for bringing the complete picture about uh, not only technology, but also the industry. And uh, with that, viewers, we come to the end of this particular panel discussion. We hope to uh, bring uh, future such uh, episodes to you. The uh, links to the um, LinkedIn profiles of the speakers on the panel are available in the show notes below. You are welcome to get in touch with them for any further information with you or any discussions you want to do. With that, uh, I bring this panel discussion to a close. Jai Hind.